yep. the ball, bypass the midfield, and knock it along to the wide areas. It was Barclays in its purest form. The Premier League is back. It's healing. Nature's returning to its original form. And football is not woke again. If you read Twitter, that's kind of the semblance you get from this game. But it was kind of true in some cases in that this felt like a bit of a throwback of Premier League football. This wasn't a display of amazing football. There was there was times where it had its moments. You know, you can't ignore it. But it was more of a, almost a bit of a chess match in terms of, you know, trying to navigate moving pieces and exploit the space and hit them directly, but subtly at the same time. And in, I thought Slot and Arteta represented themselves really well in this game. I thought Arteta, with the injuries they've got and the suspensions, coped well with it until a point in the second half where I'm going to be a bit, a little bit more critical. Whereas Arna Slot, I felt like there was good intention. I felt like there was some of those pieces that weren't really navigated into the correct position, and those pieces then didn't help him out. And I feel like I'm speaking in a very weird tone, so I'm just going to go ahead and start analysing the game, starting with the Arsenal attacking phase. So Arsenal's original stage of build-up would be in a 2-4-4. Uh, Trossard and Havertz dropping a little bit deeper than the wingers, who would stay high and wide. Rice and Moreno in the centre. And as you don't typically see for Arsenal, fullbacks in more conventional fullback positions. Liverpool would set up in a very passive 4-2-4, with Diaz and Salah alongside Nunes and Jones to try and block that centre area of the pitch from opening up and preventing any easy central passes into that box midfield for Arsenal. Uh, Nunes and Jones would look to shadow Moreno and Rice while going to press the man on the ball. So let's say if Gabriel got the ball here, Nunes would then look to go and press him from Moreno, forcing him maybe back to ooh, one, back to White or maybe back to Raya. And if it went back to White, then you get Nunes quickly dropping in and, and Jones doing the same thing. Diaz would then tuck in a little bit more to prevent any real opening to Rice just through that gap that was maybe created. It would leave an easy pass to Part, but I felt like that was something Liverpool were willing to accept and then once it would go back to him they could recover quickly and get around to him but it wasn't it wasn't engaging and, and Timber and Party did sit quite narrow they weren't looking to stretch the pitch in these build-up areas so it wasn't as much ground for Liverpool to cover and Liverpool were narrow they they were compact horizontally as well as vertically McAllister and Gravenberg deeper they would typically look to take care of Trossard and Havertz who would drop into these wide 10 positions this did leave an issue with Canate and Van Dijk as as a result they didn't have anyone to mark they didn't have anyone to deal with one on one their tasks would have been protecting their fullbacks when the long ball came in as it did time and time again Without Odegaard, Arsenal do lack a, a, a great deal of quality in that midfield area to get on the ball and make things happen. Havertz and Trossard just ain't it. They're good players, they serve a purpose, but not in terms of creative presences in the middle of the field. I don't want to labour on the point too much. You guys know how I feel if you've watched this channel before, how I feel about Rice as a deeper pivot. I just don't think he's got the technical qualities to make possession teams tick. And Moreno's the one I know the least about in this team, but I, I feel like he's, he's more of an all-purpose player as opposed to a, a tempo set. So it was always going to be the long ball over the top, which Arsenal are, are okay with doing. They're, you know, they're okay with mixing it up short possession. They're okay with going long and direct. Whereas on this side, you had the long direct option to Martinelli where they could hit fast option, quick off the mark. And we know that Trent Alexander-Arnold has his weaknesses defensively. But Canati did a fantastic job of coming across to cover him, did excellently in these areas. And while Martinelli did get the beating of Alexander-Arnold a few times, Canati was always there on hand to just mop up in behind. As Martinelli would look to make these movements down to the byline to, to maybe get crosses in or or dribble round and, and force goal-scoring opportunities, Canati would say, cover Trent well. And, and did his job brilliantly, which is a lot easier to do when you don't have a striker to face off. He realised where the danger was, and he looked to, to kill it off. And I think Canati is having a fantastic season, if you ask me. But stuck to his role and stuck to his tasks in this game beautifully. On the right-hand side, however, it wasn't as simple. And you could see this demonstrated perfectly for the first goal, with the long ball over the top from Ben White. Saka running in behind Robinson, who I think Robinson will go down as one of the top five left-backs in Prem history. It's been a bit of a decline, and I think Liverpool's failure to address that left back, left centre back position, is going to cost them in terms of maintaining a Premier League title challenge this season. I just think it's such a weak area of the pitch, and the lack of depth in behind isn't it isn't helpful. Of course, it's one position. They've got tons of quality positions. They've got really good depth. But I think that is such a weakness that teams will look to exploit. And Van Dijk didn't offer that same covering quality that Canati did on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, rather, for Liverpool. And so at points when Robertson was beaten, Saka was able to get in and, and, and 
get into good goal scoring opportunities without the threat of Van Dijk coming to press him and engage with him as he did for the first goal. The issue that Robertson also has is that Saka's not just a player that will take it down the line. He'll take it inside and run into the centre areas of the pitch, into the half space and look to create from there. He can also just face up Robertson one-on-one to get crossing opportunities in. As always with Arsenal, they're not so stuck to a certain formation, a certain shape. There's fluidity, there's flexibility, and they would alter it. And this is how they would do it. They'd have Kai Havertz coming into this area in the right 10 position. Then you'd have Trossard in the center 10 position in this area here. Again, no striker, false nine vibes. Moreno would push up into the left half space. Rice as the single pivot. Partey coming in a bit more centrally. Timber a bit more centrally. And Gabriel. Now, while this made the, the earlier stages of build-up a lot easier for Liverpool to deal with, it meant that Curtis Jones could just drop on Rice, Diaz and Salah could come in and deal with the space a lot easier between Rice and Timber and Partey and could look to go and engage with them. It left Nunes to press the centre-backs where he could shadow the one and press the other. Where this did leave him more vulnerable is in this area of the pitch here as Gravenberg and McAllister were left with two on three situations constantly uh you know there was always a free man and with Canati and Van Dijk those aren't center backs that will look to engage so let's just say if they both split to go into Moreno and have it Canati and Van Dijk aren't players that will comfortably come and press Trossard here and, and risk leaving that space in behind they don't have the most defensively strong fullbacks to allow that because with Martinelli and Saka's pace and their direct threat that space could kill Liverpool. So you wouldn't see Canati and Van Dijk engaging. So at points it did leave some passes that were quick and easy from the back to front to the player in between the line, whether that be Trossard, whether that be Havertz, whether that be Moreno. And as well, they had players now within the half spaces that if they decided to go direct still to the wide areas, there were half space runners. You saw Moreno especially getting into this area of the pitch quite often. Timber offered support as well as he'd move into this area into the left half space, maybe allowing Moreno to sit a little bit deeper. And would cover space as well if Martinelli moved inside. So there was a lot more fluidity on that left-hand side. On the right-hand side, however, it, again, was where they were a bit more exposed. As, as it would go on, Partey would come in very central, almost playing like an inverted fullback at points in these areas, which created space in the sort of right-back position. This would drag Diaz in a lot more narrow, as he was tasked with watching Partey. And you'd have Kai Havertz moving into this right-back position, which allowed Saka to push on a little bit higher and created this pass in here. McAllister would then be stretched into this area and the, the spaces that developed be, between him and Gravenberg at points was killer for Liverpool as they were just tasked with marking so many players in these deeper areas of the pitch and Gravenberg wouldn't be so willing to come across and cover they didn't get the protection of Diaz and Salah that dropped in and so you were leaving one of these midfielders or even an inverted timber free and and as I say the, the spaces that developed between them at points meant that Havertz could play a ball into this area here to get onto Trossard or if Gravenberg came in a little bit too close to McAllister the ball over to Timber or Moreno so passes like that were always on it also meant that he could le link up more effectively with Bukayo Saka and then make that movement into the half space so in terms of a midfield battle Arsenal won. Liverpool did get a bit more streetwise and they started dropping Diaz and Salah in the second half to, to just offer that midfield to a little bit more protection but first off, it was a bit of a nightmare, and I'd say that that midfield two just got exposed time and time again. And with the centre backs sort of having to compensate for the full backs at points, they couldn't be freed up to go and engage. So you've got to give them credit. Arsenal, I think, won the midfield battle without the real quality in that midfield to go and and make and pay in those areas. Like Trossard and Havertz are good. I'm, I'm this isn't the you know criticising them, but. That Odegaard, that X factor to get the ball in these centre areas, to hold on to it when the press does come and pick the right pass with that real next level technical quality is is such a use and an asset to this team. But that's how Arsenal approached the game from an attacking point of view. And what is it like from a defensive point of view? So Liverpool would build up as they built up pretty consistently under Arna Slot, which is with the back three of Robertson uh, joining in in that a little bit deeper. Robertson very narrow. Trent Alexander-Arnold pushing up into a right-back position. Gravenberg showing a little bit deeper. McAllister just a little bit further on than that. And Jones operating a bit higher up, trying to move more in between the lines. Salah and Diaz up on the on, on the wings. Salah a little bit more narrow, as we'll touch on in a second. And Nunes is the striker that would also look to drop in a little bit more and go in between occupying the centre-backs and coming into this area here. Arsenal 
pressed aggressively, 4-4-2, as they want to do. Very, very responsible shape as well in, in the way that they press. So, for example, just to demonstrate this. So let's just say if they get the ball onto this side and Canate opens up the pass to to Jones, Moreno will then move across to, to maybe try and block that passing lane as Trossard's following in over to Canate. Havertz will then move across into Gravenberg. Saka will jump from Robertson to Van Dijk and... Then as that happens and, and that attack breaks down and, and Liverpool are forced to go back, Havertz will then keep dropping in on Gravenberg. Rice moving over into the right wing position to take care of McAllister or Robertson. Havertz moving across to uh, McAllister. Moreno jumping back onto Gravenberg and Saka as the striker. All responsible. Uh, that's the work of great coaching. That's the work of just great understanding and tactical discipline to the players from the coaches. And you have to credit the work. The issue I had for Liverpool in these build-up stages was between two players, and those two players are Trent Alexander-Arnold and Curtis Jones. And it's fair to say that Trent Alexander-Arnold was marked pretty aggressively from Martinelli, and that's maybe why Salah was uh, tasked with staying in a little bit more narrow, so it gave Alexander-Arnold the freedom to go and attack the width on that side. If he did, Martinelli would follow him in. But I've said it before, Trent Alexander-Arnold is a fantastic player. He's an unreal player with talent to die for. But he needs to offer a bit more press resistance, and sometimes it feels like if he doesn't have the time to take a touch or two, you you break him a little bit, you, you, you make the pitch shorter for him. He doesn't have that drop of the shoulder. He doesn't have that ability to just take one touch out of his feet, create space for himself, and bang a pass out. It looks like he needs to see the pitch for a period of time. And the space that was available for Liverpool was with Curtis Jones. In, in tactical and personnel areas. So Curtis Jones, I felt like, was staying a little bit too deep in these areas in terms of he was tasked with being that half-space player and tasked with being that, that player between the lines, but it didn't feel like he was dropping so deep to the point where uh, that space opened up huge. And, and Arsenal did manage it fairly well. In, in those pressing stages, there was space between the midfield four and the defensive four for Arsenal, which they didn't exploit anywhere near enough. But that pass was on, and it did feel like there was a lack of willingness to find them. It also feels like with their rigid, narrow positioning, Liverpool, they're not great at making angles into that area. So Gravenberg and McAllister will sit quite narrow. They're not they're not stretching the play. They're not trying to force holes in between Havertz and Moreno or, or, or Rice and Moreno, as, as typically was. And so that passing lane doesn't get opened up. Trent Alexander-Arnold always comes in a little bit more narrow as well. So he'll drag Martinelli inside. And so as a result, that then also closes that lane up into Curtis Jones in this area here. And it just feels like it's so rigid at points in that build-up structure from Liverpool. They, they don't open space up well enough. And as a result, as much as there was space that Curtis Jones could attack, he, I don't think he has the required press resistance to, to get against a, man or a, a Martinelli or a Moreno in this area, turn and get running with the ball. And the Liverpool team didn't do a great job of creating space. Alexander-Arnold's positioning didn't do him any favours, left off. Arsenal quite central, left Liverpool quite central, and Arsenal's press was good as well, take nothing away, they were aggressive, they were getting up against Liverpool, preventing them playing, Gravenberg and McAllister didn't have any real time to get on the ball turn and play into these areas, and and the few times it did come to a Curtis Jones or a Darwin Nunes dropping in, Gabriel was, was very adept at coming to press, coming to engage, and preventing them from getting on the ball, where Van Dijk and Canati weren't, Gabriel has that aggression, he has that intensity, and, and did a really good job of preventing them from playing so they'd be forced back and i just think sometimes with this narrow shape it doesn't take a lot of a lot of movements like maybe could alexander arnold come into this position and him and jones have a bit of bit of partnership where if one came inside the other moved out into the fullback position you guys know how i feel about narrow build-up structures as it is and just give martinelli maybe something to think about and then as a result maybe you create more space for alexander arnold who's got a good first touch if a difficult ball is played to him that he could get on and play you know, could there just be a little bit more rotations? Could there just be a little bit more fluidity to help break that Arsenal press, which is fantastic. It's elite. But don't make it so easy where they're just pressing one-on-one. -on -one. And to be fair to Declan Rice, I felt like he was prepared for, you know, those those changes and, and that space in behind. I felt like he was always aware of it because it always uh, it just looked like he was sat a little bit deeper in initial stages than the rest of this this midfield four. So that with Jones's position, if that ball did come to him, he could quickly move across and cover it. Let's just say if McAllister moved off a little bit, uh, 
higher, then he could go and press him and get on the ball and prevent him from playing. It just felt like he took up real smart positions at points, Declan Rice, to mop anything up that came in between the lines. And intelligent, tactically. I've always had my criticism of, De- of Declan Rice's ability on the ball. Off the ball, however, he, he's as good as they get, really, from a holding midfielder. His, his awareness of space, his ability to deal with quick exchanges of play and direct attacks is, is elite and phenomenal, and I'll never take that away from him. So as a result, Liverpool found it hard to play through the centre of the pitch at points. Where they did have a bit more success was the direct option, and that came from either Kelleher or Van Dijk. Getting on the ball in these deeper areas, struggling to break Arsenal down and going out wide and direct. Didn't have as much success with Salah on this right-hand side as as he was coming in quite narrow to Timber, so there wasn't that separation for him to get on the ball. Now, the luxury you have with Salah is that you could play long balls that maybe aren't as accurate, and his first touch is, is silly good, and he can deal with the hardest of long balls, but it didn't feel like there was as much invitation to go and play those balls to, to Salah. Where they did get a lot more success at points was getting the ball to Diaz, and to be fair to party, he defended Diaz really well, dealt with the long balls, but that was still a threat, and it was still a direct option that Diaz could use against Partey, won corners, which Liverpool scored from, and Ultimately, Partey is a, is a centre midfielder and he's a player that's played fullback many times in his career, but that isn't the most natural position against a player who's got such a speed advantage as Lewis Diaz. But Partey dealt with him very well, but he did always get that space Diaz to initially receive the ball because of how wide he was. And in the second half, to be fair, they brought in Sabozla in the centre of the pitch and there was a lot more quality in between the lines. He was able to take it on the half turn. He was able to take it under pressure in between. It felt like he was making space a lot more than than Curtis Jones was. And as a result, Liverpool had more of a threat. I don't know what it is about Arsenal in these second halves. They need to stop dropping so deep. And so, like, I can't remember who said it on punditry, but it was almost as if they were playing with a red card again. They got so conservative, so deep, so compact. They weren't pressing as much. They were having, letting Liverpool have a lot more prolonged periods of, p- of possession in the middle of the pitch where they could then play and, and, and create openings and get on the ball and, and play passes and get the ball to the likes of Sabozla, like get the ball to the likes of Nunes or whoever had come on, you know, and and Trent Alexander-Arnold getting a bit more freedom to play the pass for the second goal. And I, I don't know what it is with Arsenal in the second half of games. They don't maintain their real good first half play into second half. I get with some of the games there's been red cards, but I don't think you can always use that as an excuse. The City game you get a bit of forgiveness for. This game where you, you, you've got 11 men on the pitch, I know they had injuries, but I still think... You can't use that as an excuse so much when Arteta's been there as long as he has and he's he's spent the money he has. I know that obviously lessens the quality, but this is a squad in his image. He's got a very good squad of players, so you can't then moan when you're forced to use that squad of players. And as a result, when you allow Liverpool to have prolonged periods of possession, you're forcing yourself to sustain periods of pressure for longer. You're asking for trouble with players that excel with time and space on the ball as Trent Alexander-Arnold got, which he didn't have in the first half. You know, then space could be created for the likes of Darwin Nunes with Salah then moving inside. So it just felt like they dropped a point where they didn't, or dropped two points rather, where they didn't need to Arsenal. And look, it's not a bad result, but I think Liverpool will be the happier of the two teams. I really do. Because I don't think, I think Arsenal for the majority of that game were the better team, but Liverpool have come away with a point. And I think they've allowed themselves to be caught in that position. They'll blame injuries. I'm not having it. I think I think it was a missed opportunity for Arsenal, which I think they needed after some of the results recently. But full credit to Liverpool. They're getting results, getting points, where you can argue they've not been the better team, but it shows resilience, it shows character, it shows strength, and they're getting good victories and, and, and draws at home and away against tough Premier League opposition. So, so that idea that Arnslot hadn't played anyone half decent yet has kind of gone out the window. We're starting to see him up against the best now, and, and he's more than holding his own. So, yeah, a little bit of luck, of course, but, you know, who doesn't get lucky at points? But I'd love to know what you guys think. Like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you disliked it, comment down below and tell me why either way, and I'll see you next time. In a bit, lads.